What's going on guys? It's Nick here, back with another video. We'll be going over every backfield today, talking about which running backs I'd be starting and sitting this week. But before we do that, have to start things off the stat of the day. Yesterday's stat was which wide receiver led the league in weighted opportunity rating last week. And the answer is Michael Thomas. And Jace was the first to get that one right. Today's stat, just one quarterback has at least 20 passing touchdowns, but is not in the top 15 in fantasy scoring. Who is it? All right, so this is Thanksgiving week. So usually we start off with the one Thursday game. We got three this week, so... Pay attention to that one. You're going to probably have someone on your roster that plays on Thursday. So we'll start off with the 12-15 kickoff, 12-15 Eastern, and that'll be the Texans traveling to Detroit to take on the Lions. This game is a 51.5 point total, and the Texans are three-point road favorites in this one. For the Texans, David Johnson is still in the IR, so Duke maintained a pretty massive role in the offense last week, although he did lose a few snaps to CJ Procise. And despite playing 77% of the snaps, Duke only had 10 carries and 5 targets, which he only turned into 35 total yards. Fortunately for Duke, this is pretty much the perfect spot. You know, the Lions ranked 27th in rush defense DVOA. 30th in yards were carry allowed, and they've given up the most fantasy points to opposing running backs. So Duke is a flex play given the matchup, but he has definitely been underperforming, and I have a lot less confidence in him than I did when David Johnson went down. And I think it is possible that ProSize gets a little bit more work this week, which is obviously going to hurt both the floor and the ceiling of Duke Johnson. Of course, you're definitely not playing ProSize this week. For the Lions, Swift has a good chance to return this week, and neither Peterson nor Karrion Johnson did anything in his place last week. So when he's back, I fully expect DeAndre Swift to be the featured back. And given that this is also a good matchup, this is a game when both running backs have really nice matchups, I do consider him in that like low-end one to high end running back two range. Again, he's gonna need to be cleared. So even though we've seen him return to limited practices, you, he needs to be cleared of the concussion protocol to play. Maybe he is by the time you guys are watching this. As I'm recording this, he is not yet cleared, but just pay attention to that and don't play him if he's inactive. But speaking of the matchup, you know, the, the Texans rank dead last in both rush defense DVOA and yards per carry allowed while giving up the third most fantasy points to opposing running backs. So Swift is going to go off in this matchup if he is cleared in time to play. And so play him if you got him. 430 game is going to be the football team at the Cowboys. This game has a fairly low 46 point total. I'd say it's more normal in other seasons, but we have had a fairly high scoring year. So a little bit on the lower side in this one. And the Cowboys are actually three point home favorites, which is, I guess, a little surprising given that the football team stomped them a few weeks ago. But three points is basically what you assign a home team. So if two teams are perfectly evenly matched, the home team should be a three point home favorite. If we see the home team only a one point home favorite, it means that, yeah, they're the favorite in the game, but they're actually, in general, the slightly worst team. So Vegas is basically saying football team and Cowboys are evenly matched opponents, but the Cowboys are home, so they get the three-point favorites. For the football team, uh, Gibson saw his second most carries of the season last week with 16, but then he only had two targets, and that was due more to the game script than, uh, you know, a change in volume, because we saw McKissick also drop. McKissick had... 14 and 15 targets over the last two games, and then he dropped down to four last week. So this is why we kind of like Gibson so much, is that when they're down, he's not getting the same sort of targets that McKissick is getting. But he's still getting three, four receptions in those games, and that's a really nice floor. But then when they're winning, you know, we see McKissick drop way down in the targets, but Gibson goes way up in the carries. And so we love to see that, so that improves his floor. But then also what we love to see of these touchdowns. He has now eight touchdowns on the season, which is very impressive because Washington ranks 27th in touchdowns per game. When they get close, they give the ball to Gibson. And that just shows you how massive of a role he has in the red zone when 
You have eight touchdowns. That's a lot of touchdowns at this point in the season. And on a team that ranks 27th in touchdowns per game, I mean, we know Washington doesn't score all that many touchdowns each week. So eight touchdowns is a lot. Uh, so he's got good touchdown upside. He's got that reception floor. This is a good matchup. And so I do view him as a low-end running back one this week. I'll say this week is a little bit thin at running back. We've got a really nice top, like, I don't know, 12 to 13 running backs. Then when you get into that 14 to, like, 30 range, it gets thin pretty fast. So saying someone's a high-end two this week, I guess, isn't as great. But he's been really good. I mean, he's the running back 10 on the season at this point. So I would be playing uh, Gibson if I had him. I do have him, and I am playing him. Uh, as for McKissick, despite what we saw last week, uh, again, the four targets was more game script related. It could happen again this week because maybe Washington does dominate Dallas. But I think this game is going to be relatively close, and so I would expect him to see more than four targets. In a full PPR league, I think you can play him earning back two. In a half PPR league, I think it's more of a flex play. In a standard league, you're probably not going there because his touchdown upside is much lower, and then the receptions don't help you in standard. But in half PPR, I think he's a solid flex play. Full PPR, you can probably play him at running back two. The final Thanksgiving game is going to be Ravens at Steelers. This game has a 45-point total, so even lower, and the Steelers are five-point home favorites for the Ravens. Ingram and Dobbins are out this week, so the backfield's down to Gus Edwards and Justice Hill. I'd expect Gus to get a lot of the early down work and for Hill to take some early down work, but then most of the passing down snaps. This is one of the three most difficult matchups for running backs. It's basically Steelers, I'd say Saints, and Bucks. Uh, you can probably throw the Bears in there as well, but Steelers, Saints, Bucks are kind of the three we look at, we're saying this is a really, really difficult matchup, and especially in Pittsburgh. So even though these guys are going to get this increased workload, it's not like Lamar throws to running backs anyways. It's not like the total is very high. The Ravens team total is very, very low compared to what we expect on average. And so you can play Gus in the flex if you really need to, but I would prefer to leave him on the bench and to leave a Justice Hill on free agency. I don't really think you should be rostering him at all. For the Steelers, we've got James Conner pretty much dominating the running back touches and running back snaps. The problem is they're running a lot of sets where they don't even have a running back on the field. And so, yes, you should be using him because he's at home, he's a favorite, he's being featured, but he's more of a high-end to mid-range too because even in spots recently that it's been a good spot for the running back and even in games where they're up 10 20 points they are throwing the ball on a very high percentage of their plays and that has not been benefiting james Conner. this has been a massively pass heavy offense and it's clearly working for them so why would they shift to the run game so I think you are playing James Conner. I'd be surprised if you had, you know, three running back ones ahead of him. But it's more as a mid-range running back two, even though it might seem like this is a good spot as a home favorite. Titans at Colts is up next. This game is a 51 and a half point total. And the Colts are three and a half point home favorites. For the Titans, always start Derrick Henry. For the Colts, I guess we'll see. You know, this will, I guess, be uh, some sort of indication if Jonathan Taylor is taking over in their matchup two weeks ago. Uh, in this exact matchup, we see Hines erupt for 115 yards, two touchdowns, while Taylor gets 37 yards and no touchdowns. Then we flip to the Packers game where Hines only had 33 yards, no touchdowns. And then it's Taylor that's the one around 115 yards. So this is a smart team. It's very possible that they're just looking at matchups and just playing the best running back for that game script that they want or just the best running back that day because you know some of these backs just have bad days. Does that mean Hines is going off this week? No. You know, it means that we can't assume that either of them will. I don't think either of them should be fully trusted as a running back too. But if you want to play one of Hines or Taylor in the flex, I'm okay with that. Just realize that it's very likely only one of them has a good game. And it's very likely that half the people who play these guys are going to be disappointed. Because even if, you know, we're looking at this like only one of them at most is going to have a good game. But it's possible that the Colts just don't have that great of a game here, and maybe neither of them do well. I think that's the less likely outcome, but you gotta realize that for each of these backs, it's probably like 55% of the time, they don't have a very good game. And so realize that going in. 
lot of upside here for Jonathan Taylor, a lot of upside here from Naheem Hines. Only one of them will do well. You got to choose which one you think it is. Next game we've got here is the Panthers at the Vikings. Uh, this game is a 48 and a half point total, and the Vikings are four point home favorites. For the Panthers, they'll be without Christian McCaffrey for another week, which means that we do get another game of Mike Davis getting the bulk of the workload. They had a very positive game script last week, and Davis had been struggling going into that matchup. So be a little careful with over-projecting Mike Davis here. Running back is thin, like I mentioned, and so he is a mid-range running back too. But there is definitely a gap between him and some of the mid-range running back ones where there wasn't a few weeks ago. You know, a few weeks ago when we had Mike Davis as a starter, you were locking him into lineups and he was producing in any matchup. Now, he hasn't been producing as great. I mean, watching him play, he does still look pretty solid. And so that's why I have him as a running back too, just because if he's going to get, you know, 15 to potentially 20 touches in these matchups and he still looks solid, I think you're, you're playing him if you do have him. But I don't think it's as much of a slam dunk as it was heading into these last few weeks because the production has been a little bit lower and we have seen them willing to not feature him as much. And so be careful, the floor is a little bit lower, but again, mid-range running back too, because it's not a bad matchup and he's still gonna get a decent amount of volume. Speaking of the Vikings though, of course, uh, we're always starting Delvin Cook. They're always very easy breakdowns. The only times we start Alexander Madison is if we think that the Vikings are just gonna absolutely dominate, which I don't think is the case this week. So when the Vikings are like 10, 15 point home favorites, now we start looking at Madison, but Madison is in general just a handcuff and someone that when he has those spiked weeks, they're generally coming in games where the Vikings are crushing. Next up, we've got Chargers at Bills. This game has a very high 53 and a half point total and the Bills are five and a half point home favorites. This should be a really fun one to watch having Herbert go up against Josh Allen. Uh, and it could be really, really fun if Eckler is able to play. He's expected to resume practicing this week, which is a massive sigh of relief for those of you who have been patient with him. It does not mean he's going to play, but it opens up the possibility that he will. The moment that Eckler is activated, I think you're playing him. I do not think they're rushing Austin Eckler back. So if he's out there, I think he's healthy enough to play. And you're not playing any other Chargers running back when Eckler's back. However, if he does remain out this week, then I do think Kalen Balazs should be treated as like a low end two to a flex play just because of the volume. He's not actually a good running back, but if he's gonna get the sort of workload he's been getting, I think you gotta play him as like a low end two to a flex. Uh, for the Bills, Moss has out snapped Singletary in three straight weeks and out touched him over the last two with Singletary only getting five touches per game over these last two weeks, I wish they would just shift the workload to one of these two backs, preferably Zach Moss because he's better, but just give one of these backs all of the workload. It's not going to happen, and so the floor and ceiling of both of these guys is pretty low. But we see with Moss, he's the one they give the ball in the red zone. He's the one that has a touchdown upside, and so his ceiling is definitely higher than Singletary's. Also, the Chargers do have a fairly below average run defense and the Bills are fairly sizable home favorites in a pretty high total game. And I do believe the Bills have the highest team total of the week as of right now. That could change as lines shift. But right now, the Bills are projected to score the most points of any team this week. Because of that, I think Moss is a viable play in the flex. Singletary can be used in the flex, but I would reserve that for deeper formats. I think in a 10 or 12 team league, Moss is fine in the flex, wouldn't go there with Singletary. Next up, we've got the Browns at the Jaguars. There are a lot of moving parts in this game with people testing positive, and because of that, Vegas has removed the line. But realistically, no matter what the line ends up being, if this game is played, you're starting James Robinson, Nick Chubb, and Kareem Hunt. I know the Jaguars are having a new quarterback, but all three of these guys have basically earned weekly must-start status this season. And so if you've got any of these three backs, just play them. I don't even want to waste your time with the breakdown. Play them if you got them. Giants at Bengals is up next. This game has a 43-point total, and the Giants are five-and-a-half-point road favorites. That's probably the last time I'll ever say that. Five-and-a-half-point road favorites for the Giants. That's how bad this Bengals team is going to be post Joe Burrow. Wayne Gallman is pretty clearly 
the best running back on the Giants, and he's actually scored five touchdowns in the last four games. Freeman will be out again this week since they placed him on IR. So the competition for Gallman is really down to Alfred Morris and Deion Lewis in a game that the Giants should actually win. And so Wayne Gallman should be viewed as a low-end running back one to a high-end running back two. That might feel pretty weird to hear, but he's probably going to score a touchdown. He's got 20 touch upside. He's got reception upside. And so in this spot, I think you're playing Wayne Gallman if you've got him. For the Bengals, Bernard is going to split some work with Samaj P. Ryan, but P. Ryan is obviously not someone that we're looking at to start here. The point I'm bringing up, though, is Bernard's not getting 90% of the snaps and 90% of the workload. Like, P. Ryan's going to be in there for a few plays. He's got the potential to steal some goal line work. Because of that, um, I have to lower Bernard in the rankings, but because Bernard does have reception upside, and because the Giants aren't a good team, their defense is fine, but because they're not a good team, there's definitely a possibility that the Bengals still win this game, even with their backup quarterback, their practice squad quarterback. Uh, I mean, Brandon Allen, I don't know if you, you guys don't know, Finley uh, came over as the quarterback, I guess took over as the quarterback when Joe Burrow was out last week, but then they activated uh, Brandon Allen from their practice squad. There's a real possibility that Brandon Allen is worse than Finley, but just, just realize that they do not have good quarterback play. But also realize that the Giants are not a good team either. And so either of these teams could end up winning. It's only a five and a half point spread. So while I think the game script will favor the Giants, it's possible it favors the Bengals. And so you can still play Bernard. I think it's more of a flex play because as I alluded to, uh, low total game and the Giants have a better defense than most people think. And P. Ryan's there. So there are a lot of factors going against Bernard this week. But... If they're trailing, he could have some receptions. He could score a touchdown uh, in this spot still. And so if you got him, flex play. Don't have to do it, though, because, again, his quarterback is Brandon Allen. Next up, we've got the Dolphins at the Jets. Another low total game at 44.5 points. And the Dolphins are seven-point road favorites. For the Dolphins, Gaskin is allowed to return this week. And if he does, then... We're going to have to figure out what we think the split's going to be between him and Ahmed. I talked about this already this week, but if they split the snaps, then I don't think either of them are going to be viable. The targets are just not there right now for the running backs, and even the carries would be relatively low if they're splitting behind a pretty bad offensive line. So even in a really nice spot, any team playing the Jets is in a great spot for pretty much any position. If they're going to split, that really hurts the floor and the upside of Gaskin and Ahmed. So if Gaskin returns this week, I would prefer to wait a week and just see how many touches does he get, how much does Ahmed get, and then go from there in week 13. But if you really, really need to play one of them, you can in the flex just because the Dolphins should have a really positive game script, should I have a lot of plays where they're playing with the lead, which means they're going to lean towards the running back in this spot. If Gaskin remains out, I think you are playing Ahmed as like a mid-range running back too. For the Jets, unfortunately, Michael Pirine was going to be the featured back, but then he got hurt and he's going to miss some time. I believe they placed him on IR, but he's definitely out for this week. And that puts the backfield back in the hands of Frank Gore. It would be preferable if you had better options, but... If Gore is going to see around 15 to 17 touches, that makes him viable in the flex. Just remember, this is Frank Gore as a seven-point underdog against a pretty decent defense, so he's by no means a must-start. Raiders at Falcons is up next. This game is a 55.5-point total, and the Raiders are three-point road favorites. For the Raiders, always start Josh Jacobs, and Booker is still just a handcuff for Jacobs. He's only going to get a lot of work when they're dominating. Don't expect them to dominate this week. For the Falcons, Todd Gurley played only 37% of the snaps last week as they gave more work to Brian Hill, Ito Smith, and Brandon Powell. I really hope you guys sold high on Todd Gurley when you could. Despite this being a soft matchup, he's got a really difficult end of season schedule. And I really just don't think any Falcons running back right now is someone that I would want to start. So I would bench all of them, even Todd Gurley. Cardinals at Patriots is up next. This game is a 49.5 point total, and the Cardinals are 2.5 point road favorites. 
For the Cardinals, this is a good matchup against a Patriots defense that ranks 31st in rush defense DVOA, 21st in yards per carry allowed. Unfortunately, Drake and Edmonds are in a split right now. It's a pretty even split. While Drake had five targets last week, the split in general is Drake's going to get the majority of early down work, but that Edmonds is going to get some early down work and the majority of the passing down work, with Edmonds also having a fairly large role in the red zone, although we have seen Drake get a good amount of carries in the red zone as well. I think both are decent flex plays, but I do have Chase in three out of my four leagues, and I am probably keeping him on the bench in all of them. I'd say Drake has slightly more value, but it's a very, very small amount. So if one of these guys scores a touchdown, they're probably going to be more fantasy viable. But I mean, how do we even predict that, right? It's basically just going to be who's on the field when they get into the red zone. And because of that, again, I think both are viable in the flex, but you do not need to start either. For the Patriots, we see Rex Burkhead unfortunately tear his ACL last week. But Sony is probably going to be active this week, you would think. And so the backfield should be Harris, Sony, and White. If Sony is not activated, that would be a boost to Damian Harris. Not really a boost to James White. I don't think his snaps are getting affected by whether or not Sony plays. Um, but it likely means that if Sony's activated, that Sony and Harris are going to split the early down work with White seeing more snaps than he has been recently. For me, Sony is still unplayable. Even if he returns, I don't even think he's worth a roster spot. And then both White and Harris would be fine plays in the flex with obviously James White is better in a full PPR league and he gets worse as you move towards standard. And then Damian Harris, he's like fine in all formats, but again, he's going to be much better when the Patriots are in uh, game scripts where they're winning and they give him a bunch of the workload. But as soon as the Patriots fall behind, Harris sees his snaps get tanked. And so if you think that the Patriots lose this game, you know, Harris and Sony are not the best plays and definitely not people you need to be putting in your lineup. And James White would probably have a good game in that scenario. If you think the Patriots win this game, well, then Harris is a much better play. But again, still kind of someone that you should put in the flex because he doesn't have all that much upside. Next up, we've got the 49ers at the Rams. This game has a 45-point total and the Rams are 7-point home favorites. For the 49ers, it depends if Mostert is going to be playing this week. If he's active, then I would personally be playing him. It'd be roughly as a running back too, but I mean, I know it's a tough spot, especially uh, as a road underdog and a pretty big road underdog, but the 49ers are still going to run the ball in pretty much any game script, and Mostert has been very, very good this season when healthy. So if he's active, I'd personally be playing him. If he's inactive, then McKinnon would be the lead back, and you could definitely use him in the flex. And I'd say in a, a full PPR league, you could use McKinnon as a running back too if Mostert's out. But if Mostert is active, I don't really think that I would play McKinnon because Mostert has proven this season he's pretty clearly their lead back. For the Rams, we have our usual mess. We see a split between Henderson, Brown, and Akers. In that order, though, for snaps, it's pretty clearly Henderson's the lead guy then Brown, and then they're trying to get Akers some touches. But the problem is, it's not like, oh, we're in the red zone, let's give it to our lead back. I mean, we see Akers with a touchdown last week, even on less than 20% of the snaps. So you have no idea who's getting the touchdowns. The passing volume to these running backs is fairly low. And if they're going to also split the early down, I don't trust anyone. So I would not start a single Rams running back this week or really until one of them takes over. Next up, we've got the Saints at the Broncos. This game has a pretty low 43.5 point total, and the Saints are six-point road favorites. For the Saints, I know that Hill hurts the value of Kamara and Murray, but Alvin Kamara is just too talented for them not to use him in the receiving game. I think that they correct their mistake from last week, and they feature him more in that area. I do still have him as a mid-range running back. One, definitely less valuable than he was with Breeze. I think he'd probably be the running back one on the week if they had Breeze active, or I guess a top three running back. But I think he's more of a mid-range running back one, just because Taysom Hill just didn't throw down like any running backs last week. And so if that continues, we'll reassess it moving forward. But I do think it was more randomness. I do think Alvin Kamara is not going to see like eight, nine receptions, but could he have four or five receptions this week? I think that's possible. Again, if it doesn't happen, then we reassess next week. But I think they recorrect from last week. For the Broncos, um, and oh, actually, I guess before we do on the Broncos, if you were thinking of starting Murray, 
don't. I mean, you really only start Murray when Kamara's out or they're going to score a ton of points, and I don't think either of those are going to happen this week. So Murray, I keep on the bench. For the Broncos, uh, Melvin Gordon and Lindsey have been just kind of splitting the, the snaps evenly, and that has been proving to be uh, a very, very bad for both of their fantasy values. But last week, they went off. And so, in general, though, these two were splitting. And so when we went into last week, it was like, okay, they need to be very, very efficient to be viable. Well, they were very efficient. In a game, we didn't think they would be against the Dolphins. The problem is they combined for zero targets, you know, after commanding three total targets the week before and combining for one reception over the last three weeks. So these guys have three weeks where both of them are playing one reception. So I know that as luck gets more healthy, that's probably going to correct itself. But it's definitely a problem, especially this week, because... They're taking on the Saints. You know, the Saints are one of those teams I mentioned, the top three most difficult matchups for running backs. And you could argue it's the most difficult matchup for running backs. And so I do not expect either to have a great game. They are going to need to score a touchdown to pay off. And it's not very likely they score a touchdown. And so I would bench both. Next up, we have the Chiefs at the Bucks. This game has the highest total in the week at 56 points. And the Chiefs are currently three and a half point road favorites for the Chiefs. We went over this week how Clyde seems to have taken over as the lead back, which is definitely good because this is a difficult matchup. So he's going to need that extra volume. The Bucks rank second in rush defense TVOA, first in yards per carry allowed. So even though Clyde is getting more volume, I can only rank him as a running back too because he is going to need a touchdown to pay off. And even though it took over as the lead back, like he's still not getting that much volume. So I think running back two, and then I don't think you're playing any other Chiefs running back. I mean, this is a very, very difficult spot. For the Bucks. Fournette and Jones seem to be like switching who gets more snaps. It's kind of random, uh, but neither of them looked like they wanted to be out there last week. They both looked dreadful. Fournette's looked really bad these last few weeks. That's not shocking because he's not a good running back, but he's looked exceptionally bad. And so realistically, I would not want to start either of them. The Chiefs don't have like this lockdown defense, but well, what has given you the confidence to play Ronald Jones or Leonard Fournette? I know he erupted, talking about Ronald Jones, two weeks ago. But almost all of that value came on one run when they were back at their own goal line. And he just busted through the line. Like Other than that, since Fournette has joined the team, neither of them have really done anything. And so I would prefer to keep both on the bench. If you really needed one of them, it would be Ronald Jones because I do think he is more talented. But again, I'd prefer to bench both. The Sunday night game is going to be Bears at Packers. This game is a 45-point total, and the Packers are massive. Eight-and-a-half-point home favorites for the Bears. This is a great matchup against a Packers defense that really struggles defending running backs. But I would only play David Montgomery. He is the only running back I would play in this backfield. And that's if he's active, you know, he might still not play this week. I think he will but I guess you never know with concussions. And so if he's out there, I'd play him as running back too. If he's out, I'd avoid this backfield entirely. For the Packers, it's the same as every week. You're always starting Aaron Jones. And Williams can be used in good matchups, but this is not a good matchup. So I'd keep him on the bench. The Monday night game this week is Seahawks at Eagles. This game has a 50-point total, and the Seahawks are five-point road favorites. For the Seahawks, Carson is expected back this week, which means that he'll likely split the work with Hyde. The Eagles have been worse against the run than in recent years, but with Carson and Hyde splitting, it lowers both of their floors and ceilings. Carson is the one that you would want because he'll likely get more targets and he's the more talented of the two, but I can really only uh, move him up to like a mid to low end running back too because this is his first week back and we don't know exactly what the role is going to be for these two. As for Hyde, I'd prefer not to play him, but if you do need him as like a second flex in a deeper format, then that's fine. Um, and then if Carson remains out, I do think Hyde is a good play. So Carson out, 
Hyde, good play. Carson in, Hyde, eh, not that great. Prefer it in like a 14-team league. On the Eagles' side, Seattle is a pass funnel for sure. Pretty good against the run. And the Eagles are underdogs. So while Scott had some work last week, Miles Sanders is the only one that you would really want to be starting. And he's still more of like a, a low-end running back one this week because of the matchup. He's getting enough volume. He's very talented, but bad matchup. Losing a little bit of work to Boston Scott means, and the offense is also very bad, uh, low end one for me. Again, no other Eagles running back. So that is a breakdown of every backfield in week 12. If you want to see my exact rankings on all players, then you can check that out at our website, thefantasyfootballadvice.com. But that's the end of this one. Hope you all did enjoy. If you did, then how about hitting the like button and how about subscribing to the channel if you're new? But thanks for watching.